Our second reading comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Please hear the word of the Lord. Finally, brothers, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, And as of shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end... Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, how we are reminded that this is your world. But in that, we are reminded that there is a battle before us. One that competes for the hearts, minds, and souls for the people of your world. Give us the armor that you see fit to prepare ourselves for the everyday battle before us. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Well, this morning, we begin part two of our three-week sermon series entitled The Armor of God. If you are joining us, Today, for the first time, here's just a quick recap of what we looked at last week. Last week, we covered essentially the book of Ephesus. Because the reality is we are looking at chapter 6 and we are starting with the last chapter, really dropping ourselves right in the middle. And what we've discovered thus far is that Ephesus is no ordinary city. But it's a port city on the coast of Turkey. It is a Roman capital city where trade comes and goes, taking place for really goods and services, ideal for the place of the gospel to go forth into neighboring nations as well as the world itself. Paul, he spent three years of his life at the church of Ephesus. There, he poured into the body, strengthening them with God's word and building them up in their faith daily. He shows them that they are chosen by God and that God's love has stretched to the world, one that includes the Gentile nation. It is for that reason that Paul knows that as he has built them up, that evil will come and try to bring division within the church, creating separation. It is for that reason as he gets ready to leave the church of Ephesus, as Luke records, fierce wolves will come in and among you, and they will bring division. It is for that reason that he calls us and says, therefore, put on the armor of God. We then looked at the first piece of armor that God calls us, the belt of truth. Understanding that without truth, Nothing holds together. For the belt 
is linked to virtually every other piece of armor. It offers reprieve and support. We are then reminded that Jesus is our truth. And upon him, we can stand firm. So that when the enemy comes within our lives and whispers lies of deceit and doubt, we can then go back to that truth and stand on his word. So that leads us to today, where we're going to look at the next three pieces of armor. We're going to look at the breastplate of righteousness, what it means to put on the shoes of readiness, and we're going to look at what it means to take up the shield of faith. So first, the breastplate of righteousness. As we mentioned last week, each piece of armor serves as a comparison model. In this case, the breastplate is compared to righteousness. It is the largest piece of armor worn on the soldier, covering their entire torso. It is how fitting that it should be compared to righteousness itself. Reminding ourselves all the while that we dare not clothe ourselves or arm ourselves with our righteousness, but that we put on God's righteousness. Paul, he would have had this visual image up close and personal for several different reasons. One is the idea of his background. Because of his Jewish tradition and the way in which Paul was being groomed, Essentially, he was being groomed to be the next high priest. Paul would have remembered of his Jewish upbringing. Number two, he would have remembered daily because of his present condition. Because Paul is not chained to some dark dungeon within his prison. His prison is literally being chained to a Roman centurion. So that wherever that centurion goes, Paul then follows. Paul, though, is chosen and called by God because of his great education. He is one that can communicate to that given point in time within the world. We remember in Acts chapter 6, this is how strong essentially his upbringing is. That he gives a testimony to King Agrippa as well as Festus. There, he begins to give a bit of his resume. He says these words, my manner of my life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. He then goes on to give testimony before King Agrippa, telling King Agrippa about his Damascus Road conversion, how he was struck with a blinding light and there heard the voice of Jesus himself calling him to stop persecuting the church. Festus, though, interrupts Paul and he tells him, your great learning has made you mad. Acts chapter 26, 24 says these words. And as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. Simply put, because of Paul's education, And because of his background, he would have been reminded of Isaiah 59. Here, God searches Israel, looking for someone, anyone who would be righteous enough. As God searches, he finds no one. Isaiah 59, 15 says, truth is lacking. And he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it. And it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation. 
and his righteousness upheld. He put on righteousness as a breastplate. The idea of putting on God's armor, again, it's not a new concept. Paul is reminded of these words as he would have studied them long before this moment. But then his present state would have been another visual image as he is chained to a Roman centurion. Acts chapter 28, 16 reminds us, and when he came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier that guarded him. So when Paul tells us to put on the breastplate of righteousness, Paul then has a constant reminder because of his past learning and his present state. Being reminded more than anything else that we are invited to put on God's armor and not our own. The interesting thing here is, and while it serves for every piece of armor, but especially the breastplate, as we arm ourselves with righteousness, we put it on, carrying ourselves, knowing that we clothe ourselves with what his invitation is. He extends that invitation to us as we arm ourselves with what is already his. What does righteousness look like then? It is the perfect life lived. And more importantly, it's the perfect sacrifice. It's Jesus that we clothe ourselves with his righteousness. It is by his blood and his blood alone that we are invited to put ourselves in what he has already done for us. We're reminded again in Ephesians 2, we can't earn this righteousness, but it is a free gift to those who would openly receive it. Our scripture reminds us it's not a gift in which we can earn or no one can boast, but it is a free gift that is before us. Trust me when I say, when we go to battle, you do not want your own righteousness, for it will fall short, ending with a spiritual, mortal wound. We do not want to stand before the king of kings, declaring to him that it is by my righteousness that I should enter your gates. I love the classic allegory, A Pilgrim's Progress, written by John Bunyan. In it, Bunyan tells the journey of a young man by the name of Christian, who is, coincidentally enough, he is from the city of destruction. He flees the city, realizing its fate. But along the way to the celestial city, he experiences foes that beg for his attention, wanting him to turn around, or worse yet, wanting to bring him harm. Along the way, Jesus takes Christian's burdens from him. He takes his burdens and then he gives him the armor, the armor of God. Not long after a Christian takes up this armor, he has his first real adversary, a creature by the name of Apollyon. Bunyan writes these words. In the Valley of Humility, Christian had severe trials. He had not gone far when he saw the fiend Apollyon coming across the field towards him. The sight of him filled Christian with great fear that he began to wonder what he should do. Should he go back in haste or stand ground, going calmly on his way as if he had no fears at all? Then it occurred to him that he had no armor for his back. And to turn his back on the enemy would give him the opportunity to pierce his back with darts. He decided to hold ground to keep straight on the way, that would demonstrate his faith, uphold his principles, and be safer for his person than turning and running away. I know this is just an allegory, but I think it serves as a great reminder 
that as we put on God's breastplate of righteousness, it reminds us that we then have the necessary tools to go toe-to-toe and to face whatever enemy is before us. And we dare not turn our backs, for we are promised that the victory is in Christ himself. After we put on the breastplate of righteousness, Paul then tells us to put on the shoes of readiness given to us by the peace of the gospel. What are we then to be ready for? We are to prepare ourselves for all circumstances that come our way. As Paul looked at the Roman centurion's shoes, he would have been reminded of the battles that would have come. I like the way that Francis Folk puts in his commentary as he describes what it means to have the shoes of readiness. Francis says these words. Paul says, having shod your feet with the equipment of the gospel of peace, that the word translated equipment can have two quite different meanings. It may be preparedness, and some taking this as the right meaning here assume that although defense is the primarily in the apostle's mind and his description of the Christian conflict in this passage, he cannot just think of Christians defending themselves. They must go forward with the gospel of peace. Part of their necessary equipment, therefore, is the readiness at any moment to take out the good news of peace to others. How true is this for our lives? That we need to be prepared in all circumstances, ready to advance the gospel at whatever cost. We don't know exactly where one's heart might be in the big picture of things. We don't know if we're the first of a, among a many series of conversation for that person. And we don't know if we might be that last person that might have the privilege of literally leading somebody to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Many of you all know we had Sam's Calra as a guest pastor a few weeks ago. Again, I will say, if you haven't heard it, please go back on YouTube, find us, and just listen to his message. That's his incredible testimony. But I had the privilege of just having a small conversation with him. And I began to share with Sanj and be able to say, I've had this friend in my life, and I've been sharing the gospel with this person for years now. He reminded me, you're not responsible for the outcome, but you are responsible to be ready. Sanj then shared a story with me, one that reminded me that we don't know where one's heart might be. He went on to, to say that as he pulled in his own driveway a few weeks prior to being with us, his wife decided to have the entire of their furniture reupholstered. And there in their driveway was the man who was responsible for it, clipboard in hand. As Sanj said, Scott, I don't do this, but being prompted by the Holy Spirit, I got out of my car. I had never met the man before. And without hesitation, I walked up to him with no introduction and simply looked at this man and said, Are you ready to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? This man, well into his 70s, dropped his clipboard, opened up his hands, and said, yes, I am. As they prayed to receive Christ, tears began to well up within his eyes. And he said, can you call my son and tell him what has just happened? Sanj called his son shared the news that his father had just received Christ. His son then replied, I have been sharing the gospel with my dad for years, wondering if that day would ever come where I would see him 
live for Jesus. Sand was just the end. That's really just the beginning. We don't know in the grand scheme of things where one's heart might be. But one thing we are called to do, we're called to be ready. Francis Folk goes on to say, though, another meaning of this Greek noun is preparation in the sense of prepared foundation. And thus it appears to be used also in the same way in Psalm 89, 14. This would give the meaning here, the knowledge of the dependency upon the gospel that gives a person peace in heart and life as a necessary equipment. Like the hobnailed sandals of the Roman soldier, if he is to stand firm and foothold in conflict. So let the shoes of your feet be the gospel of peace to give you firm footing. This second meaning fits the context with its dominant thought of being able to stand unmoved against any foe. I love this imagery that Francis brings as we look at a centurion's footwear. A centurion's footwear, though, would have been not only ready to advance the gospel, but also would have been ready to stand firm in the moment to come. You, you may have caught it, though, in Francis' descriptions as he described them as hobnailed sandals. You see, these are no ordinary sandals. On the bottom of these particular sandals are metal tacks driven in to the bottom of every sandal. This would have given a preparedness in advancing as well as firm foundation to hold your footing. Because you know as well as I do, when you walk on leather for so long, it wears out. But having that hobnailed sandal gives it a longevity like no other. What a great reminder that when it comes to the gospel, we're called to advance and stand firm. Or maybe a better way to put it is the way in which Paul writes his letter to Timothy. And he says these words, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. How are we then to be ready? In season and out of season. Which is when? Always. Then Paul tells us, though, to take up the shield of faith. It's interesting enough, though, that this is the one piece of armor that reminds us that this is fitting for all circumstances. Again, I don't think Paul is just looking at this armor, trying to think of clever words or ideas that would be fitting but I truly think that when he looks at the shield, he is reminded of how well it covers our whole body. Thus, faith should do the same. So what does faith do for us when we pick it up? Scripture reminds us that it not only covers us, but it is able to extinguish all flaming darts from the evil one. This may sound kind of odd at first, but then we begin to understand the craftsmanship of what Paul is really looking at. One of the first things we understand about the shield of faith is that this is no ordinary shield that Paul is talking about. The Greek word here is thyros, which coincidentally enough is the same word used for door. So if you can imagine this centurion would literally carry around a door to protect himself. I like the way Kent Hughes describes as to what this looked like in detail. Kent says these words, the shield indicated here in distinction to the small round shield worn on the forearm in battle. This was a large shield about four feet high and about two and a half feet wide, very much like a door. The Roman shield was made of two layers of laminated wood, covered first with linen and then with hide, and then bound 
top and bottom with iron. A man could put his entire body behind it as it absorbed javelins as well as arrows from the enemy. In the case of flaming arrows, very often the arrows would snuff out as they would bury themselves in the thickness of the shield. During battles, these great shields would often bristle with smoked arrows like roasted porcupines. So if you could just kind of picture for one moment this four-foot door, so to speak, being covered in arrows, smoking with fire, but never able to penetrate. I've also heard it said, though, that soldiers would take their shield and they would dip them in water, creating another barrier for the flaming areas that were before them. The description, though, of what faith can do for us doesn't just end here. The shield, though, was also designed that it would actually interlock with those who were next to you. I could take my shield and I could link it up with the soldier next to me, creating a barricaded wall. Or I could take my shield and I could go over the top, resting my shield on another shield, giving us reprieve from attacks from above. I like the way that James Montgomery Boyce puts it. He says, our faith should be like three things. He says these words. Our faith should do three things. Number one, it should cover us so that not a portion is exposed. Number two, it should be linked up with the faith of others to prevent a solid wall of defense. Number three, because it covers our entire person and links up with the faith of our fellow soldiers, it should be able to strike down whatever fiery arrows the enemy hurls at us. So if you can, picture this moment where we link our faiths together. Where you're weak, I am strong. And where I am weak, you are strong. Linking our faith together, creating a seamless barrier where we can march on together. No wonder Paul uses the shield as a relation to our faith. Because I believe that it's more than just imagery. But it reminds us of how we are to cover ourselves with the faith of our Lord. For he will protect us from literally every temptation that comes before us. So what does faith look like? I think it's described well within the author of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. Again, I've talked about it before, but when it comes to faith, it doesn't mean that we throw reason and logic out the window, but that it brings us to a place to use them as tools so that we can go as far as we possibly can. And then when we come to that place of uncertainty, we take our faith and we put our trust and to who and to what God has given us, knowing that Christ has already won the battle. As we move forward throughout the course of our day, next week, and even our lives, one thing I want to constantly press upon us again and again, it's not our righteousness. It's not our shoes. It's not our shield. None of the armor is by our own hands. But it's for the Lord and from the Lord. For when we dress ourselves in our own righteousness, we fall short, opening ourselves up for greater attack along the way. We therefore Put on the breastplate of righteousness, which is Jesus' perfect sacrifice. It is by his blood that we are made whole. We then put on the shoes of readiness, 
knowing that we are called to be ready both in and out of season. We then take up the shield of faith. And while we might not understand everything, we come to a place of trust, regardless of what the outcome might look like. For when we dress ourselves in our armor, certain failure awaits us. But when we dress ourselves in his armor, we can rest assured the battle is already won. To God be the glory. Amen. Again, let me thank you for joining us in our worship today at First Presbyterian Church of Gainesville. I invite you to come on Sunday and join us personally at 1055 in our sanctuary at 106 Southwest 3rd Street in downtown Gainesville. We have other ways to be involved in the ministry offerings of First Presbyterian Church, children's ministry, music ministry, a ministry with college students. You can reach us at 352-378-1527 or on the web at 1stpc.org.